Welcome to the Insurgents Podcast with Frank Viola. And he's brought a friend. This is the podcast that supplements Frank's groundbreaking book, Insurgents, Reclaiming the Gospel of the Kingdom, which is shaking up the Christian world. You can find out details about the book at insurgents.org. Sit back, open all four ears, physical and spiritual, and join the insurgents. Here's Frank. Welcome, friends, to another edition of the Insurgents Podcast. And as per usual, I have a conversation partner, and it is, once again, Tim. Bo, Timbo, and we are continuing our conversation on every reference in the Gospels to the Kingdom of God. And today's scripture is out of Matthew 25. It's often called the parable of the wise and foolish virgins, or the ten virgins, or the ten maidens, or the ten girls, or the ten bridesmaids. We're going to call it the parable of reserved oil. Tim, why don't you read it to our listening audience? All right. This is from the English Standard Version. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out and meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, Go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Mm. One note here is that the word for lamps is not the same word as the word that appears in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus tells us not to hide our lamp under the bushel basket. That's the, That word in the Sermon on the Mount is the word for a lamp that you would use in your house to provide light for your living space. The word here is a different word that is used to describe an outdoor lamp or torch Mm -hmm. that was used for processions and outdoor activities at that time. And this will be a, this will be a important piece later on. I think another word worth noting is this word virgins. So the word there is virgins. It's the same word that's used to describe Mary as a virgin. So, it's, uh, you know, some of the translations have bridesmaids or, but that's a piece of the, that's a piece of the story too. Mm. And reread the verse that says flask, they brought their flasks of oil, something to that effect. Right. What verse is that? That is in verse four, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. Okay. So they have, they have this torches. And then they had extra oil in a flask. Right. Reserved oil. Doesn't the ESV use the word torch in a footnote? Yes. It has the word torch as a footnote. Okay. And I know the Darby translation, I believe the Darby translation actually uses torch instead of lamp. Well, there's a lot here. And, of course, the Lord is talking about his second coming. Uh, We have five virgins who are ready. We have five who are unready. And the ready are referred to as wise or prudent. And the unready are referred to as foolish. And the theme here is judgment and readiness. Being prepared. That's the focus. The kingdom in this parable is future. Some view these two groups as being true believers, authentic 
regenerate Christians versus false professors, those who just simply profess to know the Lord, but they really have never been converted. There's simply a difference in the way they're treated in the end. And one can make a case for both viewpoints. Maybe we'll talk a little bit about that at the end. This parable reminds me of the wheat and the tares, the good fish and the bad fish, the foolish builders and the wise builders. And later, and we'll discuss this in a future episode, the sheep and the goats. We have this dichotomy. But I think before we begin to make application, Tim, we would do well to step back and just talk about the Jewish wedding. Mm. Because I think it throws light on what was happening here. To be a bridesmaid in that day was a great honor. And a nightmare would be if you were unprepared and shut out of the feast, the wedding feast. The weddings were typically held toward the evening and torches were part of the celebration. And as you pointed out, it's very unlikely, and many scholars have stated this, that these were lamps, Herodian oil lamps, carried by the hand. It's far more likely that these were torches which basically were sticks wrapped with oil-soaked rags. Now, the wedding feast occurs after a day of dancing, and the bridesmaids leave the bride with whom they have been staying, and they go out to meet the bridegroom with torches in their hands, because, again, this is an evening, so there needs to be light. They then escort the bridegroom back to his bride. And they all, in turn, escort the bride and the bridegroom to the home where the bridegroom is going to live or has been living. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Torches most likely did not burn indefinitely. We can see that from the parable. According to some evidence, they may have burned for only 15 minutes before the burnt rags would have needed to be removed and new oil-soaked rags would have to be wrapped on the sticks for new light. And this is the meaning of trimming or preparing their torches. Bridegrooms were often late in their comings and there was an announcement when they had arrived. Now during the period between betrothal, that's engagement and marriage, which could have extended several years. The young woman, the bride, remained in her father's house. And when the wedding day came, after the bride was suitably adorned and perfumed, she would be taken in a festive procession to the groom's house or that of his parents, if the couple were going to live there. And about nightfall, the procession began. The bride would be escorted to the groom's house by an entourage with torches or lanterns. The groom would go out to receive the bride and bring her into his home, where blessings and celebration would last as long as seven days. And in some texts, the bride and groom were both accompanied by an entourage through the streets on the way to where the festivities would be held. And so the groom is understood as bringing his bride back to his house or his parents' house after observing a banquet at the home of the bride. There is a passage in Luke, we have a statement by Jesus where he says, be dressed ready for service and keep your lamps burning like men who are waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. I tell you the truth, he will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. So that's another passage that refers to this issue of having your lamps or torches, in the case of Matthew 25, burning, being ready. The sequel to this procession is the wedding feast, which took place in the bridegroom's house, and that was the high point of the celebration. So that's just a little bit of background. But as we pointed out, Craig Keener, one of the greatest New Testament scholars, if not the greatest New Testament scholar of our time, 
says that all the evidence demonstrates that these were real torches, which were used in Greek and Roman wedding ceremonies. Sticks wrapped with oil-soaked rags. And of course, the wise virgins, bridesmaids, had reserved oil because those torches were going to go out. And it was very common for the bridegroom to be late because of negotiations between the bridegroom and the bride's father over the dowry and so forth. (laughs) So it was not uncommon for the bridegroom to be late. And that's why all of the women fell asleep, which is never condemned by Jesus. That was not a problem. The problem was that some of them did not bring enough oil to last through the procession. And I think all of those details that you shared, Frank, are important because as as you've said before, it's it's too easy to interpret parables as, oh, it's a simple little story with a simple little lesson. Yeah. And that's almost never what a parable of Jesus is. And it's easy to take the last verse of this parable, you know, watch, therefore, or keep awake, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. It's easy to say, oh, well, there, there's, the, there's the lesson for us. Stay awake. Keep watch. But that misses the point of the parable because, as you just pointed out, all of the virgins fall asleep. Because it's easy to say, well, the mistake is, you know, you're you're not paying attention, you're not staying awake, you're not keeping watch. Mm-hmm. But that's not what's going on here. It's not that the foolish bridesmaids don't believe that the bridegroom is coming, right? They believe, right? They believe the bridegroom is coming. They're waiting. When he comes, they go out to meet him. All ten go out to meet mm-hmm. him. And, you know, if they didn't believe, they wouldn't they wouldn't have stayed there in the first place. And again. To emphasize, they all ten of them fall asleep. So it's not the problem. Isn't that some right. of them fall asleep and some of them don't? Mm-hmm. The, you know, the reality is, is nobody can stay awake forever, right? We're human. We have we have human limitations. We all need we all need rest. But there's a difference between the wise and the foolish. And the term that you use is reserved oil. It's it's not in the text, but oil in flasks is reserved right, oil. Right. That's what it is. It's yep. it's oil that you're saving, that you've set aside because you know that there is going to be mm-hmm. need. That's the key to understanding this parable is what is the reserved oil. That's good. And I want to add a little bit more on the historical piece because it helps us understand some of what Jesus is saying in this story. The women were supposed to meet the bridegroom and then fetch the bride from her home and lead the whole procession back to the bridegroom's father's house for the feast. Now, trying to share the oil, and we'll make application uh, on what that may mean later, but historically, it would have left too little for any of the torches Mm. and therefore ruined the wedding ceremony Mm. because the wise virgins who brought enough oil, they needed that to keep the lamp going. And if you didn't have that, the whole wedding would have been ruined. The other point is that when Jesus portrays himself as the bridegroom, which he does here, that's the clear implication. He is the bridegroom. He was implying that he was divine. And as you know, and most of you who are listening know, the bridegroom image of Christ is one of the major themes of God's eternal purpose. The bridegroom and his bride. That's part one of the book, From Eternity to Here. But here are some passages out of the Old Testament on this point. Isaiah 54, 5. For your maker is your husband. This is the God of Israel talking about himself. The Lord of hosts is his name, and the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. The God of the whole earth he is called. So God, the living God, is saying he is a husband. Jeremiah 2 verse 2, Go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem, thus says the Lord. I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride. Hosea 2 verses 14, 16, and 19. Behold, I will allure you. I will bring her into the wilderness. I will speak tenderly to her. And that day, declares the Lord, you will call me, quote, my husband, end of quote. 
I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. Jesus refers to himself as the bridegroom in Matthew 9, 15. Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast, speaking of himself as the bridegroom. Matthew 22, verse 2, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. (laughs) The son is the bridegroom. And when John the Baptist, in the Gospel of John, introduces Jesus. The opening introduction is, here's the bridegroom, and here's the bride. He's introducing the bridegroom to his bride. Although people would have come and gone during the wedding feast, the bolt of the door was locked and the door shut to keep wedding crashers and strangers out. Mm. That's interesting. Mm. And basically, the foolish had missed the entire procession back to the groom's house, which was their primary role, along with the festive singing and dancing. And they missed the critical element of the Jewish wedding in which the bride was brought into the groom's house under the wedding canopy. Historically, these foolish girls were unwelcome. In this case, would have been unwelcome, and they were in this parable. And they would carry the shame in the village through gossip for years Mm. because they had shamed the bride and the bridegroom. For us, even though weddings are important in our culture, it's hard for us to understand exactly how important all these pieces were and the symbolism behind them and the way that they brought a community together and elevated people Mm. and how each role was seen as, as, in a way, vital to the whole process. And so, you know, for us, it's like, oh, well, you know, so there wasn't, there wasn't going to be quite enough light. Well, well, you know, what's the big deal? You know, just move along, move to the next, move to the next piece. People will, people will get over it. Not so in, in that cultural context. And, and, and so for us, uh, we, you know, we can look at some of these details and say, well, you know, why not share the oil? Come on, are they just being mean? Are they just being mean mm, for not point. are they just being mean for not sharing? I mean, isn't it the Christian thing to do to share so that everybody could be included? But as you pointed out, in that context, sharing doesn't work because your torches aren't going to last just a little bit of time that you need to walk from one house to another in the village if you split up that reserved oil. They're going to go out there's going to be darkness for everybody. It's not going to function. Yes, yes. So it's not it's not that the wise are being mean spirited or being selfish or saying, right. "Well, look at you. You didn't prepare, so uh, so we're not going to help you right. because we don't care about you." It's you know it would be great if you could go and get some oil and participate in this, but we can't divide ours up because it doesn't work that way. Right, right. It, it can't function that way. Yeah. I'll put it this way. They were not being selfish, as you pointed out. They were being practical and responsible because if they shared the oil, no one would have enough. Right. And the whole wedding procession would be ruined. And that's really the issue here is the foolish virgins failed to take responsibility. And you can say they tried to mooch off their companions because they did not take responsibility for themselves. And we'll make some application to this later, (laughs) but we want to stay focused on the history. And it's not like one would not know this, right? Right. It's it's not it's not it's not like this is a secret thing or this is a this is a complicated situation. Everybody knows how a torch works. Everybody knows that it's a a short term, short term but very bright Mm. source of light. As opposed to the as opposed to the indoor lamp, which burns the oil slowly and and lasts a long time, and that's why that's why as you pointed out at the beginning, this is a de- it's an important detail. Uh, if if it's lamps, you could go down the path of well, why not share because you know you could you can you can make it last, right? But that's not the way it functions here, and this is not something that would be unknown. Mm-hmm. So the foolish virgins, they should have known this. 
They should have. They should have foreseen yes. the need. Also, the failure to open the door reminds us of Matthew seven, hmm. verse twenty-one. Not everyone who says to me, "Lord, Lord," will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Now, let me put that in the language of this parable. Lord, didn't we show up for the wedding procession? Didn't we get dressed in our bridesmaids gowns? Didn't we bring torches? We had all of the right form and yet verse 23 of Matthew 7, then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. Other passages where Jesus is the bridegroom, John 3, 29, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3, Ephesians 5, verses 21 to 33, Revelation 22, verse 2 and verse 9, Revelation 22, verse 17. All of these texts depict Christ as the true bridegroom. The wise and foolish metaphor, which is contrasted here in this parable, is also used in Matthew 7, 24 to 26, where Jesus talks about those who build their house on the rock. Um, they are wise, right? Mm -hmm. Those who build their house on sand, they're foolish. And staying on the historical peace, Tim, and we are going to get to the application, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Just stay with us. Uh, it's important to lay the groundwork here concerning the ancient Jewish wedding. We know that the Father had revealed to Jesus everything he spoke. I say nothing except what the Father says to me. Hmm. So I can imagine Jesus as a young man being at a wedding. Could have been the wedding at Cana. And he saw this whole procession and the wedding feast and so forth. And he saw the bridesmaids and their torches. And maybe God the Father spoke to him and said, Son, this is a picture of your wedding. This is a shadow of how your bride will make herself ready for your coming. When you will be one with her and she will no longer be your bride, she will be your wife, the wife of the Lamb. And we know that Jesus is a perfect portrait of God the Father. And we learn that God is a God of surprises. He comes at an unexpected time. He likes to surprise people. <laughs> He's in no rush to get his bride. She is the passion of his heart. And throughout these thousands of years, he has been preparing the bride for his coming. He has been cleansing her, transforming her, nurturing her so that she will make herself ready, Ephesians 5. And before he could get his bride and marry her, he had to first build the house that they would live in. It was often a room in his father's house, mm. the bridegroom's father's mm -hmm. house. And so we can picture this man, the son of the father. He's adding a room to his father's house where he and his lovely bride will live. And as he's putting up every board and nailing every nail, he's thinking about her. He's thinking about the wedding. He's thinking about complete oneness. He's longing for her. And this, in effect, is what the Lord is doing now. And we are part of his bride. Mm -hmm. The exhortation is to be prepared not by not falling asleep physically. <laughs> That's not the problem. We have to sleep. Jesus slept. It's good to sleep. In fact, he would sleep so deeply that there would be a storm in a boat rocking and waves crashing in on him, and he was still sleeping. So it's, <laughs> sleeping is not an issue. It's spiritual sleep. And it's failure to continue to pursue him and follow him. And I do believe that the oil, Jesus knew the Old Testament. Gosh, he breathed on it <laughs> before he came into the planet in the form of a human being. He knew the oil spoke of the Spirit. Mm. We can talk about what reserve oil means because I think that is the critical message. 
don't allow yourself to run dry. And we'll open that up a little bit. What say you? Yes. One way, I think one way to express it is that the mistake of the foolish is not that is not that they fell asleep, but it's that they they didn't invest in what would prepare them to be ready for the coming of God's kingdom. They didn't take invest the time and the effort into what was going to make them ready for the coming of of the king. So what is that? What is it that what is it that makes us ready? You know, in the parable, the the oil makes them ready because they're ready to to soak their torches and mm. and be part of and be part of the celebration, right? Mm-hmm. Be part of this joyous joyous activity of welcoming the the bridegroom. And so what what makes us ready? What is it that mm. makes that continues to make us ready to welcome the king, to welcome the inbreaking of the kingdom? Mm. I mean, and I would say it's those things that keep us that keep us to continue the metaphor that keep us on fire for the king right those things that connect our spirit with the holy spirit mm. and and what are those things that connect us with i mean it's we know some of the things that do that for most of us prayer scripture fellowship singing you know spending time with the lord in silence but we need to we need to invest in those things they don't just happen it's not just going to be there for us mm. without an investment on our part but i think the the way the parable plays it itself out is it's still not about works i'm always going to go there frank you know that i'm a lutheran i'm always going to go that it's not about works it's not it's not about it's not about works but it is about this openness what are the things that make us open to the reality of the spirit that that fill us with the oil right what are the things that let us do that the wise that's what they have the foolish not so much mm. and so it's not a matter of it's not a matter of effort on our part i would say it's a matter of openness on our part and i think the 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 kind of subtle way in my reading anyway the kind of subtle way that jesus makes that clear is that he doesn't say at the end be sure to go out and buy enough oil mm. he says watch you know he he uses that same metaphor that he uses previously stay engaged stay engaged so that the spirit is in your life making you yes. ready making yes. you ready amen matthew 24 42 therefore keep watch You do not know because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. Being watchful, spiritually alert, spiritually sober, all of that represents a continuous, enduring walk with the Lord. A continuous walk in the Spirit. When I think of the reserve oil, I think of the exhortation that Paul gives to God's people in Ephesians 5 where he says do not be drunk with wine but be filled with the Spirit and in the Greek the word there means to be continually full of the Spirit I also think of Galatians chapter 6 where Paul says if you sow to the flesh you will reap death but if you sow to the Spirit you will reap life. When I think of reserve oil, I think of a person who doesn't just start out following the Lord. I've seen so many Christians, in the beginning of their walk, they're excited about Jesus. They're seeking the Lord. They're in fellowship. They're worshiping Him and praising Him with other believers. They're volunteering for spiritual service in many different capacities. They're seeking to walk in the Spirit, but then there comes a point where some of them keep the outward form, say I'm a Christian, still have a Bible in their house, but they have stopped pursuing Him. They have stopped walking with Him. They've stopped walking in the Spirit. They've stopped being filled with the Spirit. And let me just make a point here. There is an initial filling of the Spirit. Peter, for example, I'll give you exhibit A. He's full of the Spirit in John 20 when Jesus breathed the Spirit on him. 
Then he's filled with the Spirit again in Acts chapter 2. But it didn't stop there. Acts chapter 4, it says, Peter filled mm. with the Spirit. Mm. So the filling of the Spirit, Ephesians 5, is a continuous thing. And if you and I continue to sow to the Spirit, we continue to let our torches burn with oil, then we will reap in times of need because we have that reserve oil, that reserve grace. One can argue that the foolish were never really saved. That's a possibility. But they did have oil in the beginning. Hmm. Now, you can say, well, they were around the Spirit, right? They tasted of the Spirit, but they didn't really consume the Spirit. You can argue that. Or you can say they really truly had an experience of the Lord in the beginning and then in time. They still had the form of religion. They still had the appearance, right? They dressed mm. for the part. They brought torches, but they didn't continue with him. He who endures until the end, she who endures until the end shall be saved. Whether you say they were never saved or they were saved and they committed apostasy and gave up the reality by keeping the form, right? Oh, I go to church every day. I tithe. I read the Bible. But there's no spirit. They're mm. not walking in the spirit. They're in the world. It really doesn't matter because the instruction that one would give to a person who was authentically saved and fell away, if that's your theology, or they thought they were saved or assumed they were saved, but they really were not truly authentically born again. The instruction you're going to give to both situations is exactly the same. And that is repent and trust in Jesus and surrender your life to him. It's exactly the same, whether they were saved at one time or their salvation was false, mm -hmm. right? It's the same thing. So when people argue this, once saved, always saved, or if you're really saved, you're going to persevere, Practically, it doesn't matter because if you, Tim, fall away from the Lord, right? You're out in the world. You're robbing banks. You're smoking meth. You're <laughs> you're stealing babies and selling them. Going through um, red lights. <laughs> you're, you're driving through red lights. You're chewing tobacco. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, but basically, you're in the world, right? Okay. I can speculate and say, mm, Tim really was never authentically saved and this mm -hmm. is the fruit of it. Or I can say, yeah, he was saved, but he apostatized. Mm -hmm. My ministry to you is going to be identical, whether you were saved authentically or your salvation was a fraud. The instruction is going to be, Tim, stop robbing banks. Stop stealing babies. Stop whatever it is you're doing. Repent. Repent means stop. Okay. And turn to the Lord. Mm -hmm. Come to the Lord. Whether that's your first real encounter with him or you've come back to him the one who you left. The instruction is the same. And if I can get that across to just a few of God's people, that would help an awful lot. But whatever it is, these people, these five foolish virgins, were not continuing in the reality of walking in the Spirit. And then they wanted, which is understandable, to have the girls who had extra oil to give their oil to share it with them. You can't share your own experience with Jesus Christ through the Spirit with someone else. You can't transfer that. Mm. Your walk with the Lord cannot be transferred to me. My walk with the Lord, my walk in the Spirit can't be transferred to you. I can't share it. And there's also a price to pay for it. I mean, walking in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We mortify the deeds of the body through the Spirit. There is a price to pay to have the fullness of the Spirit and to continue to walk in the Spirit. It's not a matter of works. It's a matter of responding to the cross and to the Lord. But I can't share that. And you can't share that. So when the five wise versions say we, we can't share, we won't have enough, that makes perfect sense to me because it's not something that can be transferred. Now, sure, they can encourage them. Hey, here's where to get oil. There's still some shops open mm -hmm. at this hour. Hopefully you'll make it in time. You can encourage, but you can't transfer your walk with the Spirit. Amen. That's...
that's the. I think that I really think that that's the point. And like I said earlier, you know, our our temptation in interpreting the parable is to say, oh, they, you know, they were selfish. Why didn't they share? But the point here is, in that context, the sharing isn't really possible. Mm-hmm. What is possible is the encouragement to go and fill your own flask. Mm. That's what's possible. And, you know, some of the commentators will say, oh, well, you know, where do you expect them to go in the middle of the night? They're not living in New York City where they have 24-hour oil stores. We don't know the context. And it may well be that if there's a wedding feast going on in the village, everybody's, you know, everybody's kind of awake and paying attention to what's going on. And it would be possible for the for them to go and get and get That's more right. oil. The historians I've read have said that there were shops that were open throughout the night and they could have bought oil. But even so, the point was it was too late. Right. And I think there's a message here for every person listening to this. If you have strayed from the Lord, don't count on that you're going to have tomorrow to come back to him. Tomorrow may not arrive. This is why the New Testament says, Paul Tarsus, his words, today is the day of salvation. Mm-hmm. And I believe he's even quoting the Old Testament. Now is the time. Because you can, I can, we all can end up where we're in the position that these five foolish virgins end up in. Watch, be alert, means to me living in the light of the Lord's coming and in the light of eternity. And I've spoken about this in the Christ is All podcast, living in the light of day. This is the theme of First Thessalonians because Paul is constantly talking about the second coming of Christ in encouraging the Thessalonian believers who are children of the day to live Mm. in a state of sober-mindedness, being spiritually alert and living as children of the day. So readiness is a mindset, an attitude, a lifestyle. It holds a strong message for us today because I can think in my past of people who started out seemingly having oil but then just quit mm-hmm. and but they still had the form of godliness mm-hmm. you know they still had a torch they still had some rags they still were dressed properly for the wedding feast and the procession but they ran out of oil mm. and that's a very sad thing the the message is that we don't know when the time is coming. We don't know when the Son of Man is going to come back. We don't know when the bridegroom is going to arrive. But for me, it's not just, okay, I'm going to be ready for when that moment comes, whenever it comes in the future, but being prepared for that, reserving the oil, being part of a fellowship that that nurtures my connection with the living God taking the time on my own to fellowship with the Lord, having time with Scripture, nurturing that connection with God, that, 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 that aspect of life that makes us ready for when Christ returns. Mm. Those things in themselves make the present so much better, mm. right? It's not just that, okay, we're, we're planning for the, for the wedding feast somewhere someday, but the inbreaking of the kingdom that happens through mm. our preparation, through our openness to it, right? That it's that it's the it's the old already and not yet. It's it's not just a future reality that we you know that we long for. That's true. That's mm. true. I'm longing for that day. I'm longing for the day when when there's no more crying, no more pain, no more death. I'm I'm longing for that. But the reality is, is when we are preparing for that, when we are living in the the place of connection with the Spirit, mm. a piece of that kingdom breaks into our own present reality and makes our lives better because we're, we're living in the presence of the King. Yes. That reminds me, too, of what Jesus said in Matthew 8, verses 11 to 12 that here again a feast is depicting the kingdom 
he talks about in 8 verse 11 of Matthew the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Mm. Speaking of that future aspect of the kingdom, but then saying in verse 12, the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Same idea. Some come in, others are shut out. Every believer, and this is an exhortation to both of us as well, must keep some oil in reserve. We have a joyful God. He loves weddings. He -hmm. loves feasts. (laughs) He loves banquets. Uh, All of these things depict the oneness between a man and a woman, which is a shadow of Christ and the church and his longing to be one with his bride. He's the God of the unexpected. The bride knows what her bridegroom is like. She wants to get married, and he's a romantic, and he wants to get married, and he wants to catch her unexpected. The exhortation to never let ourselves go dry is important because it's a dangerous thing to run out of oil. To run out of oil, at the very least, we miss out on the best things that God has in store for us. This actually reminds me also this parable of the danger of the empty room and uh, i talk about this in the book 48 laws of spiritual power but to allow yourself to become empty spiritually Mm. you open the door Mm. for some very dark things Mm -hmm. this is why it's vital that we continue to seek to be full of the spirit being filled is not a one-time event It's a continuous pursuing of the Lord, opening ourselves to him. Galatians 6, 8, whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. But whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. Sowing to the spirit. Uh, There's a delay between sowing and reaping. And when you're sowing to the spirit, you're pursuing the Lord. You're seeking his face. You're being in his presence. And I talked about some very practical ways we can live in his presence in the Christ is All podcast not long ago. The message is called Living in the Conscious Presence of God. But since there is a delay between sowing and reaping, when we sow to the Spirit in these ways, we're storing oil. And in times of crisis, we can rely upon that reserve oil, that reserve grace, oil that in fact we didn't even know we had. But the point is to keep the flame burning and keep pursuing him and keep walking in his spirit. That is how we continue to have oil and not run out of it. Yes. And it's something that we, it's something that, as you said earlier, each of us has to do. Our our relationship with the Lord, our relationship with Christ is ours. It's my relationship with Christ is my relationship with Christ. Your relationship with Christ is your relationship with Christ. That goes for all mm-hmm. believers, and yet we can't we can't do it alone. I mean the the message the the message of the scripture is yes we are each connected with the living God, and that connection is what gives us life. And we can't piggyback on somebody else's connection. We yes. can't borrow somebody else's faith. And yet the message is to. We do not do it alone. Yes, right. We do not do it all by ourselves. And it's that tension between our own nurturing our own mm. spiritual life, nurturing that connection with the Spirit, continually inviting God to be part of every aspect of our lives, and doing that in community. That, that's that's where the that's where the life is. It's the it's the both Absolutely. and we can't let go of either one of those. And I think that's why even in the parable it's not. It's not just. Well, there was one wise virgin and one foolish virgin. That's right. But there's there's a group on either yeah. side, Amen. right? Because Amen. because because the truth is is we do very little alone. We 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 faithfully follow with others who are faithfully following, even though we have our own responsibility to follow. And most of the time, when we go astray, even though it's our own responsibility and it's our own it's our own yes. inclination that does that. Usually there's uh, there's some other people that are going down that path with us. 
Yes. Well, it's so important you say that because the bride in the New Testament is corporate. She is corporate. Mm. She is a community. And even though she's not mentioned in this parable, which is interesting, the bride is never mentioned. She's there. She's the centerpiece of God's eternal purpose. She's central to this story. I mean, she appears in Genesis all the way through Revelation, all throughout the Old Testament story, all throughout the New Testament story. And she's vital in the sense that the Christian life was never designed to be lived as an individual. Mm. Even as an individual that will attend Sunday morning church services, but then live their own individual life. Mm -hmm. That has never been the design of God or the DNA of the Christian. We are built for community. We are built for one anothering. We are designed to live out our life with other believers. And without that, we can easily run dry. Mm -hmm. Most of the people who I have known who were following the Lord at one time and fell away, they cut off fellowship. They stopped mm -hmm. being with God's people and instead chose people who are in the world to be their closest friends. And that cannot be sustained. We have the tension that you mentioned in Galatians. On the one hand, Paul says, bear your own burden. Let every man, let every woman bear their own burden. And on the other hand, he says, bear one mm -hmm. another's burden. Right. Right. <laughs> so you have both there. And I will just say this, that there are few things in this life that are more exciting than the romance of the ages, the bride and the bridegroom, the real bride and the bridegroom. I mean, marriage is a pale image of that, as wonderful as marriage is and the love between a man and a woman and the union that occurs between boy and girl and the romance and the passion. That's all an image of the real marriage, the real romance between Christ and his church. And we have been invited into that romance. I know you have listened to this, brother, but if those of you listening to this are not aware, I took the epic anthem, Stairway to Heaven, mm. and I rewrote the lyrics to describe the passion of God's heart, the passion of Jesus Christ to have his bride, to win her, how he sees her, and to bring her into oneness. And I simply changed the lyrics, but the song, the music, the tune is identical and a wonderful sister in the Lord who has an incredible voice she performed it and there's a lyric video and I say that because I think that would be a great supplement to this story and if you want to hear it just go to frankviola.me frankviola.me forward slash romance and the lyric video will appear and you'll hear the song but every pleasure in this world is a pale image compared to the pleasure that we will experience at the end of the age with the Lord Jesus when he comes in the fullness of his kingdom and takes us, his beautiful bride. Every earthly pleasure is like plain yogurt compared to that. Mm. And this story about the kingdom shows us that the bride is central to God's purpose. The consummation of the kingdom is, in fact, the oneness between the bride of which we are a part and the bridegroom. And the oil, <laughs> that oil, that spirit is really a part of Christ. He is the Messiah. He's the anointed one. He is the one upon whose head the oil pours. It is Christ in us, the Holy Spirit, that burns in us to light the room. It exists to shine and showcase the bridegroom. The Holy Spirit does not speak of himself. He points to Christ. And so when we are walking by the Spirit, living by the Spirit, pursuing the Lord in the Spirit, it's all to point to Christ and reveal his glory and majesty and beauty. It's to showcase and shine the light on him. Not the Spirit. The Spirit doesn't magnify himself. Mm -hmm. He magnifies Christ. Mm -hmm. And I was part of a movement that emphasized the Holy Spirit for the Spirit's sake. But the Spirit has come to shine his light on the anointed one, the one whose oil has been poured upon his head. And in that way, we bear the torch. And the Lord says, keep it lit and keep on lighting it with the oil that he has given each of us through the Spirit.
which is the spirit. <laughs> I love I love that. I love that I love that forward looking image that looks forward to the to the bridegroom that points to the to the glory of of Christ coming and points there in a real life-giving way. You know, I, I like what you said. Everything, everything on this earth is like plain yogurt compared to the feast mm-hmm. that we're that we're looking forward to. And and I, I like that. I like that metaphor because I really like yogurt. <laughs> and, you know, I, I really like yogurt. I mean, it's really good. There are so many things in this world that God gives us that are so good. Just like you were talking mm-hmm. about how you know the goodness of marriage and the goodness of romance and all these good things. It's it's a reminder that we are not waiting for just the end of all the bad things. And sometimes we talk about it that way. Even what I said earlier, well, I'm looking when there's no more pain and no more death and no more yeah. weeping. Right. Yes, that's, that's, that's a big aspect of it, but there's so much more that it's what we're waiting for is not just the end of all the bad things. What we're waiting for is, is this glorious connection, connection with the living God, being in his presence in a way that we can barely even conceive on this earth, mm-hmm. joy inexpressible, feast beyond our mm-hmm. beyond our imaginings, and that's what we're waiting for. And when we're waiting for that, I think that helps us enjoy the presence and life and spirit of God right now even more. Yeah. That it, 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 it because right. it pushes us in that direction. Yes, as Hebrews puts it. We have tasted of the powers of the age to come, but the fullness of it is what we long for. And that in itself is an incentive Mm. to never run dry, but to keep our torches lit with oil. Amen. Until next time, God bless. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the Insurgents Podcast and give it a five-star review on iTunes. This will help others find it. Also, you can join Frank's unfiltered email list at frankviola.org and receive encouragement, challenges, and insights connected to the gospel of the kingdom. Remember, the insurgence has begun. Don't miss it.